Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Grains of Wisdom, an online webinar from Paris Court Distillery in which we have insightful conversation and uh, some whiskey tasting, it has to be said, with our award-winning master distiller, Mr. Noel Sweeney. So another week goes by. I hope you're all doing really well out there. A um, little bit of sunshine helping to uh, get us through these difficult times. And I hope you all have some um, whiskey in the glass this evening to um, enjoy another webinar with us. So over the past six weeks, we've taken you on the journey of uh, the whiskey making process. And Noel has given us some really good detail and uh, foundations in that process um, for all our fans and followers. So that allowed us to have and enjoy a great tasting with Noel last week in bringing us through our core range of for Cullen Irish whiskies. So this evening, um, in answer to many of your questions, uh, which have come in to us um, through your registration and by email over the, number, the last number of weeks, and thank you so much for the engagement. We're overwhelmed with the support that we have received for the webinar, and uh, we're very thankful to you all for joining us every week um, on it. So the questions that have been asked is Noel's um, distilling career and how he uh, got into distilling, what was his interest that drew him towards that, um, and so on. So that's what we aim to have a chat about this evening. And I'm delighted that we actually will have um, some of Noel's team, um, our assistant distillers on with us as well uh, in a little while, to give us a little bit of insight into how they have come into distilling in more recent times. Um, so, as we all know, a no, number of years ago, I mean, Noel's over 30 years experience now, um, which in, in, in a very um, long and illustrious career, um, and it, distilling probably wasn't something that was on the CAO forum um, back then. So, Noel, maybe we can kick off this evening and you can give us um, a little bit of an insight into, you know, what, what was in your mind when you started out and left school. Um, I know you had said you always had a, very, a love of science. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I uh, uh, started my journey, I suppose, when I left college or school. Uh, I went to uh, St. Nathie's uh, College down in Balhadrine in uh, County Roscommon, just on the border with Mayo. And if anybody is interested in GA football, Balhadrine plays football in Mayo, even though it's in Roscommon, but that's another story. Anyway, uh, I came out of uh, the St. Nathie's and at the time I was interested in a science background of some sort or another. So I enrolled into the uh, Regional Technical College in Sligo. I did a course in applied chemistry and uh, I came uh, out of there after the first year and I got a job in uh, what was a, a milk drying plant in Balhadrine, uh, belonged to a company called Shannon Side Milk Products and I was a lab technician there for the summer and uh, we used to take in uh, tanker loads of milk and convert it into a thick gooey uh, kind of uh, uh, evaporated milk compound after we took out the cream of course and then dried that in big dryers and my job was going in and out checking the drying plant you know and make sure everything was okay and that was just during the summer so um a uh, far cry from from uh, whiskey you might think but anyway um when i graduated started looking for a job and i uh eventually got uh, an interview for a with a company called chemiki churanta and i got the job and, but it wasn't even in the alcohol at that uh, stage. I, I joined in Ballina, a small plant in Corai, uh, which is a few miles outside Ballina. And uh, they were making um, glucose syrup from starch. So it's actually a process that's very much similar to producing uh, grain uh, uh, sugar. In other words, you're making the sugar, the sugar from, from uh, dried um, uh, starch and it was uh, starch that was coming maize starch as well so it went through a process and um, my job in there was a lab technician and I joined there in 1978 in December and wasn't long there till I got transferred to another section of the company which was involved in the production of alcohol and they had a uh, chemical churn that was set up in the 1930s to make alcohol from potatoes and uh, as time went on they diversified a little bit into different uh, production plants. Uh, the, the plant in Balana started making glucose syrup from starch. 
there was one in Donegal making um, starch from potatoes and there were only two distilleries actually running when I joined and that was in Carandona and in Cooley and a third one was mothballed in uh, near uh, Letterkenny. So my first role was as a laboratory technician and I was working with um, there's me in the middle, my goodness. That's an old, old photograph. Um, Very young looking there and all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually had a bit of hair then. <laughs> and I might have had sideburns even. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, brings back a lot of memories in Donegal. Anyway, um, that was me setting up a, a small laboratory in, in, in the plant in Donegal and Carndona. And uh, the idea was that they, the, they had um, the technology of fermentation and distillation and all the rest of it was there, but they didn't have an awful lot of um, uh, technically uh, people on, uh, in the distilleries doing the quality control. And they had moved from making industrial alcohol into producing what we call beverage spirit, which was neutral spirit. And um, my job was to try and improve the quality of the beverage spirit. So we, for a little while, I was working with um, Kevin McNamara, who was the chemist. He left Ken McEachorant and joined Irish Distillers as their chemist. And a few years afterwards, actually, Kevin offered me a job in Irish Distillers, but at the time, I had uh, decided not to join them. Anyway, um, during that time in, in Donegal, uh, we had some uh, serious fun because uh, we developing new techniques for analyzing the spirit. We were using gas liquid chromatography, which was brand new. And remember back in them days, uh, they didn't have mobile phones or anything like that. To make a phone call to Dublin, you had to book it. And you had this wind up telephone job that you had to ring and call the exchange and then say, can I get a call at 10 o'clock? And then you'd be lucky, she might ring you back if you had a chance. And we used to use a telex machine, like a one finger job, you know, tick, tick, tick. I learned how to type, I'm still doing it <laughs> back then. But, That's really uh, take it, taking people back. I'm sure a lot of our millennials today would, would oh, wouldn't dream of that. Yeah. It worked. <laughs> but we, we managed along nicely. And uh, then um, I got transferred from Donegal to Cooley for, uh, I think that was in around about nine, the early 1980s. And I was there for about uh, a year or two and they had ramped up production a bit because at that stage Baileys had come on the scene. Uh, now the spirit that we were producing was going to Gilby's and it was a neutral spirit for tasting so we used to taste it. So that's where I got involved in tasting spirits and uh, differentiating on nose because the quality check we used to bring the sample from uh, Kemiki out to Gilby's they'd smell it against the standard for Smirnoff and uh, if it was good, we got a thumbs up. If not, we'd have to find a different tank to send them. Um, and that happened occasionally until we got our uh, act together. And eventually we were able to uh, produce the spirit to the quality and the standard that they wanted. And Noel, was that where you, you first, um, I suppose, on re uh, appreciated, um, you know, the standards and quality that had to be adhered to? Um, and, and, and maybe that was your interest in terms of going into um, your, your master's in quality management? Well, yes, I was originally, as I said, I started as a laboratory technician. Uh, I became a production supervisor when I was in um, Ballon in, in uh, Donegal for a while and then moved to Cooley. And the guy I mentioned earlier, Kevin McNamara, he was our quality manager sort of uh, chemist and he moved to Irish Distillers. He was replaced by a girl for about six months and then she moved and then I got the job as quality manager. So, uh, um, and again, that was my role was to make sure that the neutral spirit we were making in both uh, Cooley and Donegal got approved and I was based in a head office in Dublin for about six months for that uh, period of time. Uh, and um, then, um, so uh, Chemiki was a semi-state owned company and eventually uh, the company was shut down in 1986 uh, and there were various reasons for that. Uh, Baileys had taken off as a product, they couldn't, could, Chemiki couldn't keep up with the demand. Uh, they wanted to use an Irish spirit and Chemiki didn't, uh, were a semi-state company, so they were anti-competitive, the European Union and all that carry on was coming in. So anyway, it went into voluntary liquidation in 1986. And at that stage, I moved 
to uh, the, actually the guy that gave me the job in Kemakey. He had set up his own company in about 1983 or four, I think it was. And um, I, he offered me a job in Galway as a, uh, I was going to operate the um, pilot plant. And he, he had a company that was set up to produce food flavors and pharmaceutical intermediaries. And uh, so that's when I started making uh, uh, fl flavors like ethyl vanillin and strawberry aldehyde and raspberry ketone. And I mentioned some of that in previous webinars. Uh, and we were going to uh, build a new uh, chemical plant in Barna in uh, the Gaeltacht. Now, uh, anybody knows me, I'm not very good at the Kukla Fuckle, but I get by a little bit, but uh, it was a bit of a daunting task at the time. But anyway, uh, that plant didn't get built because the local people down in Barna objected because the flavor in flavors that they were using were, were quite uh, pungent, I suppose, in a lot of ways, but, uh, and they didn't like the idea of the smells coming from the chemical plant. So it eventually got built in uh, Athlone and still running very, very successfully. But during that time between 1986 and 1989 that I was with Iron Chemicals, that's when Cooley Distillery was set up when John Teeling purchased the plant in uh, Cooley. Uh, with the intention of making a whiskey distillery out of it. And while I was still in uh, Iron Chemicals, I had been asked by um, one of the managers there, a guy called Eugene Smith, to have a look at some of the uh, analysis that they were doing in relation to the spirits that they were supplying to the Irish market before they started whiskey. So I trained up a girl in the procedures and tests that we were conducting before I left. And anyway, long story short, she uh, moved into the beer business in the Carlton and the Dock, and I contacted uh, Chem, uh, Cooley Distillery. I was talking to uh, David Heinz, who's the general manager there, and um, I, I asked him if there was a job going, and he says, yeah. He said, uh, so that's when I joined in June 1989 as the uh, quality manager. At that stage, they had a distiller called Alan Jaffe, and Alan was a Scottish guy, uh, and uh, he had started the process of uh, mashing. And at that stage, they were actually mashing. Uh, they used to bring in the, the, the malt already milled and arrive into the distillery. Uh, nowadays, that wouldn't be allowed under new GI rules. You have to mill on your own uh, site. But um, Alan was there for about a year, uh, and in 1990, September, we started to produce grain whiskey as opposed to malt, which we had started in 1989. In June 1989 was the time we put the first spirit into casks. Uh, and there's a photograph of a few years later with uh, um, this toasting the fruits of your labor. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, and um, another guy that uh, ended up in the he was actually a bus driver from Belfast and ended up owning a whiskey distillery in Belfast, but unfortunately that didn't work out for him. And, but um, as I said, uh, a guy called Gordon Mitchell joined us in 1990 and Gordon's, uh, Alan Jappy moved on and uh, Gordon's uh, took over as the distiller. And Gordon's uh, role was more in line with, you now he was a, a good distiller, he was very good in malt, uh, but his primary, initially, his primary job was to look after the grain plant, uh, and uh, which he did very successfully. And my job and role within the organization then was to uh, keep track of the spirit and the uh, stock and stuff like that. And it was at that stage, I was still quality manager, Gordon was in charge of distilling, uh, but I was keeping track of the production in barrels and in the warehouse. And we didn't have uh, fancy spreadsheets at that stage. I think I was using a pirated edition of Lotus 123 that I kind of got my hands on somewhere. But um, so I, I, I had always an interest as well in, in technology and in um, computers and that. And uh, so I picked up this course that was going on in Dundalk Regional College, but it was a, a diploma in information technology. Uh, so I did that and um, I uh, followed that line until eventually I got a, a degree in, in IT. 
and that helped me to set up a database in Cooley which tracked the stock uh, over time right up until the time I, I actually left Cooley. Uh, and it was uh, quite a, an interesting uh, project for me as well. But it was enabled us because it's a very difficult uh, process is managing the stock. Uh, there's a photograph of me on the right there and there's uh, John Teeling on the left and David Hines in the middle. And that was the year we won the International Wine and Spirits Competition Distiller of the Year Award. Uh, that would have been the first of many awards that were, came your way after that. Yeah, well, it was one of the one of the main ones that we won. Uh, that was a, a great, a great night. A great night. moment. And that piece of glass that David Hines is carrying, my God, it was a, a single piece of glass blown. And uh, I remember him bringing it back from from London and going through the scanners. And the guy in the you know, security says that must be an, an exceptionally good piece of glass. Uh, that, uh, because he says there was no flaws in it. In actual fact, there were a few bubbles, but <laughs> but they were planned. And it, it's a lovely, lovely piece of artwork, actually. Well, no, I um, might just um, comment yeah. on on I, the fact that you, you you did a number of different courses there, and just because this, I suppose, is uh, for people who are, want to get into distilling, and um, you're the continuous education that you have engaged in throughout your career it shows and um, your, your your love of learning your curiosity and i suppose when an opportunity presents itself the ability to hone your skills to kind of move on um, and and that's that's quite a good attribute to have um in any job but uh, it seems to be able to be ready to take the opportunity when it arises Oh, absolutely. I, I'm a great believer in taking on as much education as you can and, and making it available to, to the guys that work with me as well. Uh, and uh, I mean, every day is a learning day. There's no dear doubt about that. And it's funny, I had a, a Zoom call there with our um, friends over in the state in Canada about a week ago, and they were all um, lecturers and, 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 and uh, they were part of a, a a, a tasting group and uh, that was one of the questions is did, did I consider that I had learned everything and I, I was now the expert in Irish whiskey and you know I mean it's only a fool that thinks that they know everything uh, and that, that that's the way I feel anyway uh, that every day as I say you learn something new I've learned stuff over the last couple of weeks doing these webinars because I've had to go and prepare the, the, the slideshows that we've done and in doing that, you're going back and, and, and revisiting stuff that we would have done years ago. But, you know, it's, it's easy how things go in this year about that one. Uh, but, you know, refresh your memory, get back into it. And it's amazing what you do learn. But uh, so in, in, um, at that time, I, as I said, I had an interest in IT and I wanted to uh, uh, develop that. Uh, I would have loved to have done other degree courses perhaps but they weren't available. I did this one because it was through the Open University in uh, DCU uh, but it was based in the Dundalk Institute of Technology so I have been there for lectures and every month or so I've gone up to DCU as well so it was it was fun and eventually I got my uh, degree and a couple of years later then at that stage about 19 uh, I suppose we've gone back now a little bit, 1992, I think we produced our first peat malt uh, and uh, then in 1993 Irish distillers tried to buy the plant from us and I got my diploma initially in 1994 and uh, that's when we had really we started to um, make our blends and, and produce product for various people and when you had, I think we had something like a couple of hundred SKUs, uh, it's very difficult to maintain the um, uh, standards and uh, scientifically, uh, you know, keep a track on your stock unless you have the, 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 the benefit of, of, of a good IT um, database. So that's when that came into its own. But um, then eventually an opportunity came up to do a master's and I did that in uh, total quality management. And uh, that, I think I graduated out of that in 2006. But, you know, all of those times, that was the formal education bit. The informal bit is much more fun, I can tell you, uh, because you're learning on the job. And I did an awful lot of that with the people that were in various uh, plants and distilleries. I mean, my first introduction to distilling was with Anthony Owens back in Chemicky. Uh, Eugene Smith, who 
was there also. Uh, he was the general manager when, when, when I left then. And uh, we were distilling grain and that's the uh, in, uh, our grain, uh, distilling neutral spirit and grain production is very similar to that. And then when we started in, in, uh, in Cooley with whiskey, uh, the likes of Gordon Mitchell was invaluable. And Gordon left in 1995 and went off then to join uh, uh, Isle of Iron Distillery. Uh, and again, you know, it's a small business. But I remember the first time Gordon and I went to Scotland was in about 1991. And we went to uh, Pentland Research. And that was my first real experience of, of Scotch whiskey. And uh, in Pentland, we met uh, Dr. Jim Swan and Harry Rifkin, to, and uh, where Jim passed away a couple of years ago, but he was a, a, a renowned expert in wood. But it, that's where he started his journey uh, as well. He did not lot of research back then. And um, at that stage, they gave me a flavor wheel, one of the first ones that was produced. And that was a great asset to me, learning the skills of, of saying, mm, oh, cherries and blossoms and whatever the hell else you get out of these whiskies. You know, that, that, was, that was a great, great grounding. And then in 1992, we produced our first peated malt. And that's when uh, uh, we had the likes of Bill Murray coming over, uh, who is noted for writing those whiskey bibles uh, in that time. And uh, it was a, a great um, uh, uh, tribute to us that I remember the day that we were actually had our first distillate come out and, and Jim actually was in the distillery at that stage at that week and um, we gave him a sample of the peach malt and he was just so overwhelmed by it he thought it was the bee's knees and cat's pajamas and he, he you know he, he, he wasn't far wrong and he, he, you know he, he was one of if you do say so if you do say so yourself it's yeah. good to have all of these um, great names in, in whiskey from a global perspective, Noel, it must have been great to, to just to be in their company and learn from them, as you said, on the job. Absolutely. And uh, it was a, a, we were growing up with the spirit as well, because as I said, uh, we, we didn't have any old whiskey to play with. We started with fresh distillate in 1989 and 1990. And then it was uh, about 1992, Bernard Stewart were looking at taking over the company. And that's when I first met with Billy Walker. And Billy Walker is another icon in the business. Uh, he's uh, since moved from Bernard Stewart to Brucladi. Uh, and uh, he's currently involved with a couple of more distilleries at the moment in Scotland and in Ireland. And then uh, I also met a guy called Ian McMillan. And Ian was a distiller in Ahantoshan at that time as well. And eventually uh, Ian is now uh, very uh, well known at Scottish distiller uh, and uh, a consultant in his own right. And then I think in 1992, um, it was Bernard Stewart tried to take over um, Cooley Distillery, but unfortunately that fell through mostly as a result of there was a bit of a crisis in currencies at that stage when the Irish pound uh, was part of sterling and the e EMF, I can't remember exactly, but anyway, there was a run on the on the on the pound because it was a bit connected to sterling, and they had to devalue. But that screwed up the whole sterling pound relationship, and Burris Church just walked away. Uh, so the next opportunity didn't come up then until 1993, when uh, there's Billy Walker, yeah, uh, a great a great friend and a great colleague. And uh, really knows his whiskey. And Billy was extremely well uh, thought of in the number of expressions and different styles and cask finishes that he brought out. And uh, is a, a really, a really, a really gentleman from Scotland. Um, but getting back to uh, 1993, then in October, that's when Irish distillers tried to take over Cooley. Uh, and I think at the time they said they wanted to shut it down and, 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 and uh, bulldoze the distillery, but that didn't happen. Uh, and uh, as I said, that, that's, that's then, I think, in 1995 that uh, we just up to then. When that didn't happen, we stopped production for a while. And that's when Gordon left Cooley and joined uh, Isle of Iron. 
and that left me and uh, David and uh, John too and the rest of us flapping around, but we managed to pull through. And we started then supplying whiskey to the kind of the supermarkets. And in 1995 as well was the first year that I went and joined the International Wine and Spirits uh, competition as a judge. In, uh, and uh, I met some really, really interesting people and characters in the industry there. Uh, There's so many of them, the likes of Bill Lumsden from uh, Glen Morangi. Um, we had uh, David Stewart from uh, Grants and Glen Fiddick. You have people like um, Jim McEwen. Uh, we, that, that guy had such a way with words and explaining flavor and all the rest of it. It was just unbelievable. And then there were other people, uh, David Stewart, went, and these guys I meet every year, uh, most of them anyway. And uh, David Stewart is a winemaker from, from South Africa, but a keen whiskey man. And there were others, and there were people from the supermarket trade as well. Uh, a guy called Derek Strange, who was the buyer for Waitrose. Um, myself and Derek had a bit of a tiff one time over, over whether or not Peter, uh, Peter uh, Calamara could be regarded as an Irish whiskey because it was peated. And uh, so, but anyway, we got over that. But ju um, just on the, the peated, um, Noel, um, I mean, obviously the Connemara is, is world renowned and won many awards and accolades. And um, there was a question there just from Sergio's at the time, how important was Connemara to um, the distillery, Cooley Distillery? Um, when you first came out of it, obviously it was uh, trying to bed it in as, as an Irish whiskey. But at the time, it gives a little bit of context. Well, um, I mean, we were uh, the new guys on the block kind of thing in the production of whiskey and uh, we needed to have, uh, we had a strategy, I suppose, of having a, a large number of products so that, you know, if one of them took off, happy days. Uh, actually, I, I, I distinctly remember thinking to myself, when we launched Kilbegan in America, I says, if this takes off in America, I don't think we can supply the demand. Now, that didn't actually happen that way, but you know, over time you have to build your sales and it's a slow process, it takes time. You, so the number of different products that you can have in the market, sometimes that's a, a very good strategy to improve uh, your volume of sales. So uh, pieces of whiskey was something that hadn't been done in Ireland for, for uh, I suppose, 60 or 70 years, at least not commercially anyway, uh, but it is a flavor that we've researched back to the 1800s and there's all kinds of debates over what peated whiskey was produced, but because of the way that Irish whiskey went through a huge increase and then a decline, and we ended up with just one uh, producer, they tried to differentiate Irish whiskey as being different from Scotch, which had taken up that uh, challenge of, of volume and taste. And um, they had uh, advocated that all Irish whiskey was triple distilled and uh, not peated, uh, which actually uh, was true at the time, but not over time. And uh, so there you have the original, well, it's, it's, it's the newer version of the original Connemara. And um, so uh, Cooley had the idea that, well, let's, 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 let's put in a peated malt, why not? There's nothing to say that you couldn't. In the 1989, Irish Whiskey Act, there's no mention at all of, of Peter Morton. This is actually quite a, a loose piece of legislation in some respects. Very simple and very straightforward. Uh, but that has now changed and we had to, uh, with the GI, the geographical indications that come out of uh, the European Union, uh, uh, we have now got a technical file that gives you a, a fairly robust a systematic methodology of how you make Irish whiskey and it includes Peter Malt as well now. There, there is I suppose a lot of chat around um, peated whiskey and uh, you know for various distilleries um, you know are we going to bring out an expression and so on um, and as we said last week we have a pipeline of uh, innovation um, coming through which we will impart to people over the coming coming weeks and months. Um, but it would, um, I think at, at this point, Noel, it'd be, um, you mentioned uh, some of um, 
the, the great names there that you met and that you learned from. And Billy Walker was obviously one of them in terms of the blending. So, you know, lots of people know you're obviously um, a master distiller and an inductee into the World Whiskey Hall of Fame, but you also um, have very much honed master blending skills, um, which are, you know, again, a, 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 an expertise in itself. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about learning with Billy and how that came about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first uh, blend that we had to come up with was uh, at Key Began, which was, uh, we didn't, we weren't able to buy whiskey in uh, like a lot of the new distilleries, including ourselves, have done now uh, from uh, existing suppliers, Irish distillers at the time just didn't want to know anything about Coolie Distillery, it was a real pain in the behind, I suppose. So um, we had to rely on our own stock. So we had, uh, first of all, produced malt whiskey because obviously malt takes a bit longer to mature. And then we started producing grain a year later. And then Peter Malt came along as, a, as another alternative. So we basically had two different styles of whiskey, a grain and a malt. Uh, and if you're trying to produce a lot of different products from just two, uh, spirits, you kind of uh, uh, limit yourself. So the only way to uh, come uh, get around that uh, uh, is by having uh, different styles of wood uh, or, or maturing it in, 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 in uh, either brand new bar bourbon barrels is what we did a lot of at the start because again we had no other choice. We didn't have emptied casks because we only had, we didn't have any to empty until 1994. Uh, 93. So uh, the whole process of blending then is all about trying to be consistent with a product, trying to get a product that's balanced. So you have to get the right combination of malt and grain or a combination that works. Uh, there's times that you would mix these together. And it's a very, the blending itself tends to be more scientific and based on uh, what you've got in your warehouse. So if you have huge volume of, of grain and a small amount of malt, well then you have to get the proportions right. You have to work out that, well, I can't afford to put 50% malt in a blend if I've got five times much more grain than I do malt. So you're looking at a 20% blend. And even at that, if that doesn't work, you're tweaking it up and down a little bit, or you're using different ages or different wood styles. So there's a whole uh, matrix. I always say to people, we had three spirits, malt, grain and peat malt. Uh, we would have had a uh, brand new bourbon, uh, second fill and third fill. And we didn't refill casks any more than that. Uh, so you had, now had three spirits and three different uh, categories of wood. So that gave you a matrix of nine. And if you do your combinations and these kind of things, you have a, a huge variety of, of possible blends. And to uh, uh, better, then you can change the proportions of any one of those nine plus ages to give you, again, a different blend. So it wasn't really that difficult to come up with a, a range of different products, as long as they were all mixtures of malt and grain and maybe a little bit of peat. So coolly for our own blends, we had our Kilbegan was our main one, and that had a higher concentration of malt than any of the supermarket blends. Uh, the likes of the Connemara was a standalone peated whiskey initially, and that went up then to eventually where it was when I was leaving. We had a mixture of four year old, eight year old, and six year old peated malt in there. Uh, we did a couple of different finishes, uh, etc., which always helps when you're trying to uh, get a little bit of a change in a whiskey or a product. And you know, so there's a whole art of blending, and to get the balance right is always the key and to get the balance right. Uh, somebody once said to me, he says, the art of a master blender is to get the best value out of the stock that you have in the warehouse. Think about that for a little while and you, you begin to realize if you're going to sell a product at 20 euro, uh, then you can't be putting expensive older whiskey in there. You have to get that balance right as well. So there are, are a lot of factors involved in, in coming to a product that you're able to sell at a, and make money out. 
And it's, it's a real mix of, of the expertise and the skill involved um, with the commerciality of, of, from a business perspective. And I think um, in the early days uh, with Cooley, when, you, when it was uh, like David and Goliath, um, you know, as you said, you come, were coming out with a lot of different products, trying to see what actually got the traction in the market. And that whole area is actually of real interest <laughs> to people. Oh, yes, exactly. People are asking what you're drinking this evening. So, um, so some uh, lovely blend there. Um, and just, I suppose, to, to kind of answer that question for people, um, we talked <laughs> really about the early days and how you, how you got into um, distilling. But we do have um, a, a great chat planned for the days at Cooley. And we've invited a couple of, of your key colleagues um, to join us in the, that chat, which I think will be of real interest historically to a lot of people. Um, and we're hoping to do that over um, the next uh, month or so. We're just firming up days now at the moment so we might actually and um, Noel just just cut it there and um, just for the moment and just let people um, put some questions in and in the meantime we might bring in um, Dara um, and Johnny who are your uh, assistant distillers some um, members of our um, fantastic distillery team and we'll be meeting the rest of them in in future webinars but um, I think Dara what maybe you can bring is a little bit of a perspective from um, a more recent context of how you um, developed your interest in distilling and what uh, road you took to getting uh, into um, assistant distilling today? Yeah, I can. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I suppose I had started uh, from both an academic and kind of a love from brewing. Um, I went to college back in 2009 and I was doing a course in bioscience and biopharmaceutical. Um, biopharmaceutical is kind of a, it's a part of biotechnology that essentially looks at using fermentation to make uh, medicine. So I actually started studying fermentation from a very uh, early stage within that course. Uh, at the time, the course was actually set up by a, a, my mentor at the time was a Dr. Derb uh, Murphy, and he was um, actually ex Diageo, and he worked on yeast, um, and he was very, very talented at actually uh, explaining different, uh, I suppose, flavors and different. Uh, compounds that come from yeast and where that fits in with both the brewing and the distilling industry. So this course actually ended up becoming uh, the founding, or at least the foundation for the uh, distilling and brewing courses now in the Institute of Technology in Carbon. Um, when I had got to my final year, I'd done a thesis on whiskey, and it was actually a whiskey from the 15th century in Kilkenny. And I'd done quite well in the thesis and I was able to learn about all about brewing and kind of how whiskey is made. And from there, I actually started looking further into brewing and how home brewing is done. So I actually started my own home brewing. And um, when I had finished college, I had got a job with a, a small company that did bottling and blending for cocktails and cream liqueurs and liqueurs in the middle of Ireland. And I was a QC technician, similar to how Noel had started out. And I was actually testing multiple different products of incoming goods. A lot of them at the time were whiskey because whiskey uh, naturally is part of cream liqueurs. Uh, well, the majority of them anyway. So at the time, um, two years into that, my job with, uh, I suppose, the, the small firm, they had been acquired by a bigger firm and um, some people would actually know, know them as Dublin Liberties. So they started looking at bottling and doing some uh, downstream processing of the whiskey that would actually come out of this firm. So I would have started, uh, I suppose, upskilling and started learning through the Institute of Brewing and Distilling on distillation and downstream processing and how all of that is actually done. So I started doing my general certificate at the time in the Stilling Truly Institute. So the Institute are actually quite good. They're uh, able to help an awful lot of people at uh, distance learning, or you can actually do one-to-one, -one, or you can do multiple different ways in classrooms as well. And they're very good at teaching both the brewing and the distilling aspect. So I had started helping with the whiskey. Uh, I suppose in bottled and downstream process at the time and one whiskey that I always kind of found coming in quite often was actually coming from uh, Cooley and 
at the time I was, I suppose, interested in the different types of whiskies that were in Ireland and the different players in the whiskey industry. And Noel's name was always the one that used to pop up the most. So uh, I suppose from there, I started researching a little bit more and I started actually uh, looking at doing a little bit more uh, on the education side. So I started going for my diploma in distilling. As well as that, I was also uh, looking at commercializing some uh, products in the brewing industry. So I'd actually started joining a couple of different uh, societies. So I'd started joining brewing societies and I started to join the, the whiskey society. And at the time then, the Kilkenny Whiskey Guild was actually formed when I was uh, in that area. So, you know, you can learn an awful lot from all these societies and all these guilders, an awful lot of people out there that are actually experts in their fields and they're able to help an awful lot. Um, so I'd spent four years with this company and then I'd moved into the food service in beverage systems. This was actually very good because I was able to learn about the commercialization and all the different types of products that are out there and different means and ways of doing different things. I was working mostly on the research and development within the food industry at the time, but um, I spent about a year in this industry when I actually felt I had to go back to the alcohol industry. So uh, lo and behold, I kind of reached out to one of my colleagues in the former business and uh, he had actually said that there could be a startup that uh, might be interested in somebody. And about a week or two later, I got a phone call from Noel and he asked me, this was his first 2018, he asked me about it. Now on the site, might be of interest to me, it might not. And so Noel and we had a chat and uh, went to the site in the early days when it was only, I suppose, for half the distillery was there. The roof was practically, you know, mostly a sheet. And there was a bare bones of the brewing kit sitting there uh, and the stills were wrapped up in plastic. So it was a uh, very early days and I suppose I had um, kind of been blown away that I was like standing looking at the man that I had learned an awful lot about. And from there, um, I suppose I just waited uh, for a call back from Noel and I was lucky enough to receive that. And in early 2018, then I started working uh, under Noel and started the commercialization with him and the Foresight team and getting the whole plant operational. And not too long after that, then from uh, I think August, then we had a John, our other assistant distiller, join us. Well, it, uh, thanks so much, for Dara, for giving us that insight. And it just goes to show you there's so many different avenues where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, I think getting yourself in front of um, people like in the Whiskey Society, as you said, where you can just learn so much. And we're so um, lucky, really, in the last um, 10 years that there's such a, a proliferation of uh, interest in, uh, and in people in these societies to help us out. And not to mention the new courses that are available. Available. So obviously the one you did yourself in Carlo, but um, there are now some new ones. Um, I think you said in UCD and UCC as well. Yeah, so, so UCC have a food science, uh, DIT actually have one in distilling, Carlo Institute of Technology have one in brewing and distilling, as well as that, uh, the Institute of Brewing and Distilling themselves, and then there's Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. So there's multiple different avenues. Yeah, and I think as, as Noel mentioned earlier, um, there, there are so many other uh, courses in chemical engineering and agricultural science and so on. So there's always lots of different avenues to explore um, if, if you are interested in this area. So we got a question in there, um, uh, Dara, from Niall, and he's very interested in your thesis um, on 15th century whiskey in Kilkenny. He's wondering, is it published? He'd love to read it. So perhaps we can put you in contact um, after after the webinar and you can follow up on that with him. But thank you so much, Dara. I really appreciate that. And um, last but not least, um, Johnny, who is our other assistant distiller. And Johnny, you have um, a different um, story again um, in terms of how you got into distilling. So um, can you give us, give us the rundown there? Yeah, so um, I'm not into the alcohol um, scene for just coming up to five years now, but... I uh, left uh, Kilkenny College in 2005 um, from, from Carlow myself, a uh, small little town's land there in McGainey, County Kildare, on the border of Carlow itself. Um, I literally left school in 05. I uh, went to car mechanic and then when I left school for 
or roughly about two, three years, as well as helping my father on the farm. And he was also uh, into lorries and he had haulage. And back then, about zero and nine, then I left uh, my dad. As you know, families can't get along. So I uh, parted ways and I got into the, the industry of uh, precast concrete. So I was in a small little uh, town down in uh, Bunclody County, Wexford. Uh, Drumderry Aggregates was the name of the company and literally making hollow core flooring, precast stairs, anything at all to do with concrete, that's what we were doing. And um, I suppose in uh, early 2014 then we got a job doing the floors and the stairs in the Walsh Whiskey Distillery. And we were there for a good few months. And at the same time, uh, my mum and dad had a Victorian house in Lachlan Bridge and they were doing a B&B, a guest house, in a small way over uh, roughly about three to four years. And uh, that's where I met, met Mr. Jack O'Shea. So he was working down in O'Hara Brewing Company in, in Bynus Town. And uh, an odd Saturday morning, I used to throw him uh, an Irish, a full Irish breakfast and maybe a wee bix if you we were having whiskey or that uh, the night before with my dad. And literally... At the end of, uh, or sorry, at the start of 2015, then uh, the distillery was finished in Carlo, and it came up then on the Carlo Nationalists that they were looking for uh, operatives to send in CVs. So my dad rang me on a Wednesday, and uh, the CVs had to be in by the Friday. So I literally sent in the CV on Thursday, and I told him on the phone, geez, I don't think I'll be able to get it, but sure, I'll send it in anyway. So I sent it in, and uh, two weeks later, I got a phone call and an email from Aidan Finnegan. He was uh, from Northern Ireland. He was working in a bottling hall plant in uh, somewhere about uh, somewhere in Scotland, and I had to go through about five to six interviews. So I got down to the final twenty-five, uh, managed to get in, and uh, started there on the when was it? Twenty fifteen. I started in uh, the twenty fifth of January, twenty sixteen. That's when I started. So they were still commissioning the plant down there. And uh, Neil Bow was the name of the manager over four sites. They were building the plant. Um, and in that time, then, Aidan Finnegan was giving us a little rundown on, uh, obviously, how to squeeze in pot still. So we were doing little small little tests in, in the lab and uh, learning about boilers and stuff like that. And in the evenings, then, when everyone was gone home at 5 o'clock, I used to stay on with Neil Bow And Grant Morrison was actually just started with four sites, so he was there and Crowley engineering. So I was learning everything about roller mills, augers, everything you could think of, uh, steam boilers. Steam it just, just like um, Noel said there, Johnny, it's, it's the curiosity in learning and learning yeah. and you know, wanting to, to really be enthusiastic and learn more. Yeah. So yeah, so it sounds like there was lots of learning on the job. Lots of fun, yeah, definitely. Lots of fun and uh, learning. And my hobbies was into the, I was into the uh, steam engines and stuff like that. So. It was like a small scale into a massive scale, a massive steam generator. So it's just, it was amazing. And uh, then we started mashing then in, uh, was end of February coming into May. We started mashing there and uh, it was on a Tuesday. I can still remember it was on a Tuesday. Neil Bow came into us. Uh, he was giving us two days how to mash. So he came in on the Tuesday, gave us myself, uh, David McAvoy and Jerry Kavner, we literally got a little bit of a rundown and on Wednesday evening he told us she's all yours. So we were left on that then for another six months. Um, it was it was brilliant. We started off on low G's, started working our way up and uh, then it was just a tally then on uh, every day who was going to get the better OG on the, the mash ton. But um, no exciting times and then we also got rundowns which uh, got to meet loads of lovely people showing us how to smell and nose and taste whiskey with Shane Fitzharris and Woody Kane, all them good guys. And I still talk to them this, to this day, so brilliant guys. And um, then we got, um, I also got to meet. And how, how um, Johnny, then in terms of, obviously you were working with um, Welch's and, you know, yeah. such success and obviously being some of the Irish whiskey brands um, that have been, you know, on the world stage for a number of years. So when, why, when or why then did you um, decide that you were interested in moving or um, did you, where did you hear about Paris Court Distillery um, first? Yeah, so I was literally watching it online. Uh, I was also talking to Jack O'Shea at the time and I knew that Noel Sweeney, Jack O'Shea and Neil, um, 
with one other, Jack, um, John Teeling, guys like that, had the years on the, the extraordinary whiskey and everything. I was able to mash and distill and run the column still. And I just wanted a little bit more knowledge. I was able to learn stuff on the internet and books, but I wanted to learn more stuff off of someone that had done it. So Noel actually came down to me in early 2018. I don't know if he remembers it. And uh, I still remember he came down and I showed him around the whole distillery and uh, showed him the column still and the spirit we were producing. And then we went back out, I walked out to his car and uh, I told him I might meet him again at some time again. So literally was keeping an eye on the power score distillery coming on. Yeah, you, ob you obviously made an impression, Johnny. <laughs> I must have done, I must have done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you met him again then after exactly. that? So I, I kept a, a close eye on the Power Sport Distillery on the online and uh, seeing that uh, it was an absolutely super plant, the way it was built and, uh, and uh, the way the design of everything, effluent, cooling tower, everything was super job. So literally went up one day, I know they were still in the building uh, commissioning stage, the, the, the VC was still being built, but the distillery was finished. Uh, literally went up on the, it was, it was early summer. And I uh, went down to the area where Jerry and all the office crew were down in the old office and knocked on the door and there was Jerry Ginty sitting inside the door, pulling his hair out. And I knocked on the door and I said, sorry, sir, could I leave in a CV to, to, to Noel Sweeney? And he said, Jeannie Mackey, you've only missed them. So I had drove up all the way from Bunclody, but however, I left in the CV and about two weeks later, I got a call. Would I mind coming up and meeting himself and uh, Alex Pierce? And they took me out to the hotel and gave me coffee and looked after me so well. And that's how I started in Power Sport Distillery. And, uh, and, 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 we're, and we're delighted to have you um, yeah. as well as Dara. Um, you know, it's all, it is about skills and, you know, but there's a lot of personality and perseverance and just, you know, the love of learning um, and I suppose the love of the industry in general, which, you know, you, you definitely uh, show, uh, have shown in spades, Johnny. So um, thank you so much for giving us a bit of insight into your um, route into distilling. And I hope that this evening um, we have shown uh, our audience and anybody who watches um, the webinar on YouTube that um, where, you know, there's a will, there's a way. We all, there's lots of different avenues into um, achieving your ambition and, and following what you love. And um, I think, uh, you know, we have a great team here who have all uh, followed, uh, you know, their love of, of, of distilling. I am um, sorry about this, but Caroline seems to have been put on yeah. mute. And uh, I'd just like to say thanks very much to everybody and specifically to Dara and Johnny. And they're great guys to work with. And it's been a pleasure. And I see Caroline, you're back online. So maybe you'd like <laughs> yeah, to. Yeah, I'm you not off. sure um, what happened there. It wasn't me anyway. <laughs> there's a few gremlins in this um, and, um, Zoom thing every week. Yeah. Isn't there? <laughs> anyway. Oh, God. Um, well, no, look at all I was going to say, Noel, was just to reiterate again that, um, you know, in such a long um, uh, uh, and experienced career, there's there's so many um, stories and so many different avenues that we can we can um, uh, explore and develop. And I think something that will be of real interest to a lot of people is, you know, um, a chat about the time at Cooley and all the awards and being the disruptor in the Irish whiskey industry. Um, you know, at really at the beginning, probably, of the renaissance that you know we're currently experiencing um a tiny little blip at the moment but um no doubt that will come back um so as i said we will be advertising that on uh, um our, all of our social media channels um, over the next uh, few weeks. Um, we do have another webinar planned for next week, um, another um, very interesting chat and conversation um, with Noel, and um, we do hope you'll tune in for that. We'll have a little bit more information on that tomorrow. Um, in the meantime, um, do let us know what's in your glass each week. We, we love to hear. Um, the there was, uh, there's lots of comments coming in, Noel, around um, just, it's like, as um, Noel was saying, it's like being in your front lounge, having a chat with you, um, and, and great to uh, hear such open and honest uh, um, recount, uh, recounting of, of your career. Um, thank you so much to Johnny and Dara um, for sharing, and um, there's, there's another few comments on different courses that are um, available as well. So um, 
there's one in West Set Level 2 course, um, Nick Ryan runs that. Um, he's a member of the local Whiskey Society, so thank you for that, Michael. And um, if, if you have any other questions over um, the, the next week or any particular topics you'd like us to cover, please let us know and send us an email um, in response to your um, invitation to the next week's webinar. And in the meantime, um, we'd just like to uh, cheers everybody and uh, ask you all to stay well and stay safe. And we look forward to seeing you all again next week. Thank you so much. Thanks, Noah. Ciao, ciao. Thank you.